Hey guys, welcome to part two of the linear equations with one variable sections. So this is a continuation of part one on section two one and two two. So here I'm going to talk about just solving equations once they're given to you already. So in the previous section, or in the previous half of the video, uh, we had to create our own equations and then solve them. Here, we're going to assume that the equation is given to us. And it's a relatively simple question where it says solve the equation for x, x being our variable. So again, I want to remind you of the inverse operations, the uh, opposite or the inverse operation for addition is subtraction and vice versa. Subtraction's inverse operation is addition. And for multiplication, we can undo it by dividing stuff. And if we want to undo a division, we can multiply the terms. So those four basic principles are essentially all we need to solve these equations. So let's get started, actually. There's not really much else to say other than we're just going to be using those principles again and again. So we see that in this question, we have a whole bunch of parentheses. So the first thing we can do is just distribute to get rid of them. So if we distribute the two into x plus four, two times x just gives us two x, two times four gives us eight. And then we can distribute the negative in here, negative times two x is negative two x, negative times six is negative six. And here, when we distribute the three over two or three halves into four x, well, the two and the four can be reduced into two. So two goes into itself once, two goes into four twice, and then this two that's here times three would give us six x. Similarly, if we try to multiply three over two by six, the two would go into itself once, two would go into six three times, the three times the three gives us the nine. So now we're left with two x plus eight minus two x minus six, equals 6x plus 9. Now we can just combine like terms to try to reduce the amount of stuff that we have in front of us. So the 2x minus the 2x can just get canceled, and 8 minus 6 gives us 2. The right hand side we don't really touch right now, we just leave it as 6x plus 9, so that just comes here. And now we just consider doing the opposite operations to isolate the x. So the 9 is currently being added to the right hand side, so we can subtract it over to the left. So two minus nine would give us negative seven, and then the six x just kind of sticks around. And then finally, the operation between six and x is multiplication. So in order to get rid of this six, we would need to do the inverse operation of multiplication, which happens to be division. So we just divide the six over to the other side, yielding a potential solution of negative seven over six. Remember that this is a potential solution until such time that we plug it into the original equation and see if we end up with a true statement or not. So in this equation, if we were to plug in negative seven over six in for x here, for x here, and for x here, we see that we could distribute the two into here, distribute the negative, uh, and then distribute the three halves. But first, let's actually just simplify, distribute the two in here. So two would go into itself once, two would go into six three times. So that's where the negative seven over three comes from. Two times four gives us eight. And then here, I kind of just left the parentheses here for one step. I just wanted to simplify this first. So I didn't want to combine too many steps and potentially make a mistake. I just wanted to go slow and make sure that what I'm doing is correct. So from here to here, all I'm doing is just multiplying these two terms. So two would go into itself once, two would go into six three times. So I'm left with negative seven over three, that goes there. And then the six just comes down, I didn't do anything to the six. Similarly, on the right hand side, the three halves just comes along for now. Four and six could be reduced to two over three, we could divide both four and six by two. So two times the negative seven would give us negative 14. And then we have a three on the bottom for when we just uh, when we reduce the fraction, and then the six just comes down. Now at this stage, now we can distribute the negative and the three halves. So these two terms, I'm not really going to do anything with I'm just going to bring them down as they are. And then if I distribute the negative negative times a negative makes this a positive 
negative times positive six makes it a negative six. And here, the three goes into itself once and cancels with this three, which goes into itself once as well. So these two threes essentially cancel out. Two goes into negative 14, negative seven times. Two times negative seven is negative 14. So this cancels out, leaving behind just negative seven. Now three halves times six, two goes into six three times, three times three is nine. So that comes here. Now something very, very cool and convenient happens. The negative seven thirds and the positive seven thirds actually cancel each other out because they're opposite signs. Eight minus six is two. And on the right hand side, negative seven plus nine is two as well. So when we plugged in negative seven over six in for x, here, here, and here, we end up getting a true statement at the end. And this proves to us that negative seven over six indeed was a solution. It's not just a potential solution, but it was indeed a solution. And just as a review, hopefully you remember this from the previous section or from the previous half of the video. So whenever we're solving linear equations with one variable, there's three possible outcomes or three possible things that can happen. We can either be left with a variable equals a number. And if that's the case, then this number just becomes the solution. So that's exactly what we have in this case. X equals negative seven over six is a variable equaling a number. And this number that we get is our solution. So we have one solution. And let's see a couple of other examples to see what happens on this side. So let's say we have this equation, it looks kind of angry, it's got a whole bunch of fractions in it. So three halves m minus m minus the quantity m minus six equals one half times the quantity m plus four plus three fourths. And we need to solve for m, those are the instructions for us. So the first thing again, we can distribute to try to get rid of these parentheses so we have a better idea of what we're dealing with. So the three halves m just comes down, I didn't touch it. And if I distribute the negative, all the signs on the inside will flip. So negative times m becomes negative m. Negative times a negative six becomes positive six. Now here, we can distribute the one half into both these terms. So one half times m gives us one half m. One half times four, well two goes into itself once and two goes into four twice. So one half times four gives us two. And then the plus three over four just comes down. There's nothing to distribute there. Now at this stage, we can combine like terms. So three halves m minus m gives us a half m. Now, I'm skipping the steps to go from three halves m minus m to here on purpose. I want you to be able to grab a piece of paper and do this by yourself. Because these are the kinds of questions that you'll be expected to solve on a test. So I can do this in my head, but until such time that you're comfortable enough to be able to do this yourself in your head, I want you to fill in the blanks here as you're watching this video. So the plus six comes down, the one half M comes here, and then two plus three over four, again, figure out how I went from here to here. This is just an addition, an addition of fractions. So going from here to here is simply combining like terms. I'm combining these two terms because they both have an M in them. I'm combining these two terms because they are just plain old numbers. Now at this stage, we're back to inverse operations because we have a whole bunch of individual terms. So what we can do is we can subtract one half M to the left hand side. So one half M could move to the left and we can move the six to the right. And the reason we're doing that is to get all the variables on one side and all the numbers on the other side. And when we do that, we get one half m minus one half m equals 11 over four, that was already here, minus the six, because it was being added on the left-hand side. So when I pick it up and move it over to the right, it becomes a subtraction. So now this gives us that zero because one half m minus one half m is just zero. When you take something away from itself, entirely, you're left with nothing. So, and then the right hand side, again, I want you to be able to do this, you should get negative 13 over four. Now here, I also want you to pay attention to the fact that there is no variable left over. So if we go back to the previous question we solved, 
When we solve this question, at the very end, there was a variable left over on the left-hand side and a number on the other side. Now, in this particular question, we are left with no variables whatsoever. We're just left with numbers. Now, 0 equals negative 13 over 4 is obviously, and I'm hoping that you guys agree with me, is a false statement. So now the question becomes, are there any values of m, because this question started with m in it, is there any value of m that you could plug in here as a potential solution that would make this true? So is there anything you can do? Is there any number you can think of that would turn $0 into negative 13 over $4? Or zero candy bars into negative 13 over 4 candy bars? I mean, whatever measurement you want to use here, whatever quantity you want to use, you can turn zero cakes into negative 13 over 4 cakes. This is simply not possible. It's a silly question to even ask. So what that means is we have no solution. And this occurs or this appears whenever we have no variables left over and the problem ends in a false statement. Now, this is not after we plug in some sort of a number. This is saying that when you try to solve the equation and you solve this one, you solve for x and eventually you are left with a variable equaling a number. So this becomes a potential solution. Now, if you take this and plug it into the equation and you get a true statement, well, then this number becomes a solution. We're not even given the opportunity to do that here. We're just told that there is no variable left and we are directly ending up with a false statement. So whenever that happens, we have no solution. So again, our friendly chart returns again. If we are solving a linear equation in one variable, we can either have this particular case happening or this, out this outcome. This was the first example we solved where we had a variable equaling a number. And once we plugged that value, that number that we got into the original equation, and then we got a true statement, we said that we had that one solution. Now what happens if this is not the case? What happens if you have no variables left over? Well, if you have no variables left over, you have two options. You can either have a number equaling a number that's a true statement, and we'll get to this next, or you can have a number equaling a number, which is a false statement, which is exactly what we had here, a number equaling a number. But we had a false statement. And whenever that's the case, we have no solutions. So this framework really does need to be committed to memory. You need to memorize this so that whenever someone uh, gives you a linear equation, you at least n should know, hey, I should either have one solution or no solutions, or the next thing we'll talk about in a second. But this is something that you should always, always, always have in the back of your mind. So the moment you see a linear equation, you should immediately say to yourself, I'm expecting either one solution, no solution, or an infinite number of solutions, or an infinitely many number of solutions. So is it possible to have three solutions? No. Well, not exactly three. So you can have three solutions if you're a part of this, I guess, group. But can you have exactly three solutions to a linear equation in one variable? No. You can either have one solution, no solutions, both of which we've seen examples for, or you can have an infinitely many number of solutions. So let's take a look at an example that would come out of this. So here we have an equation in P. We have a linear equation in one variable, 3 times the quantity 4P minus 1 plus 6 times the quantity negative, two, negative 2P plus 2 equals 9. Again, we have parentheses, so ideally the first thing we want to do is distribute, so we have individual terms to play with. So 3 times 4p gives me 12p, 3 times negative 3 gives me negative 3, 6 times negative 2p gives me negative 12p, 6 times 2 gives me 12. The 9 just comes along for the ride. Now at this stage, we can combine like terms because we see that 12p and 12p are alike, and then negative 3 and 12 are alike. But 12p minus 12p cancel each other out because they're opposite signs. So what we're left with on the left-hand side is negative 3 plus 12, which is just 9. And the right-hand side, we never did anything to the 9, so that just kept coming along. 
So again, notice that we have no variable left over. In the previous case, we had no variable left over either, but what we had was some nonsense. We had a false statement resulting at the end. We had 0 equals negative 13 over 4. No matter what you try, this will never, ever, ever be true. However, in this case, we end up getting a true statement. So there's no variables left over, but 9 does equal 9. So now the question becomes, will we ever be able to find a number so that when we plug it in here for p, either here or here, will you ever be able to break this? Meaning, is there anything that would not be a solution? So if you were to try, say, 0, let's plug in 0. 4 times 0 is 0, so this is gone. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. So keep negative 3 in mind. And then this is gone as well. Two, negative 2 times 0 is just 0. 0 plus 2 is 2. 6 times 2 is 12. So we have a negative 3 from here and a 12 from here. Negative 3 plus 12 is 9. So the number that we plugged in, 0, is a solution. So now the question I'm asking is, is there any number you can think of, any number you want, that when you plug in here and plug in here, you do not get a true statement at the end? The answer to that question is no. Every single number that you can think of will be a solution. And the reason, or as a result of that, we can say that there are infinitely many solutions. So any number you can think of, no matter what number it is, positive, negative, zero, decimals, fractions, uh, irrational numbers, any number you can think of, it will work in that equation. As a result, because there's an infinitely many number numbers that we can think of, there are infinitely many solutions. So whenever there's no variables left over and the problem ends in a true statement, meaning a number equaling a number, in fact, let's take a look at this. So there's no variables left over, and then you have two options. You have number equal number that could be true. You have number equal number that could be false. So this we already dealt with earlier. The example we just saw was an example of this. So we're left with 9 equals 9. If we had 5 equals 5, 0 equals 0, negative 3 halves equals negative 3 halves, all those things are true statements. And when something is true, there's nothing you can do to break it. So if I said um, 2 plus 2 is 4, well, that's a true statement. No matter what day it is, it doesn't matter whether you're in China, whether you're on Mars, whether you're standing upside down, whether you had cheese for breakfast. It doesn't matter if it's raining outside. It doesn't matter if you're wearing pink fluffy flip-flops. or you know, it, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. 2 plus 2 will always be 4. So there's nothing you can do to break that from and, and prevent it from happening. So again, in review, whenever you have linear equations in one variable or with one variable, there's three possible outcomes. So when you solve the equation, you can either be left with a variable equaling a number. And when you're left with this, that's merely a potential solution. You have to take this number that you get, plug it into the original equation, and see if you get a true statement. If you do, then that number becomes a solution. And there's only going to be one solution if there is one in this case. On the other hand, what happens if there's no variable left over? Well, if there's no variables left over, that means there's a number on either side. And if there's a number on either side, you can either make that to be a true statement, like 5 equals 5, or, if you have a number on either side, then that can be a false statement, like 5 equals 7. So when we have a true statement with no variables, we have infinitely many solutions. And when we have a false statement with no variables, we have no solutions. And that's it. If you guys have any questions, please, as always, feel free to reach out. Have a nice evening.